When you're visiting Orlando as a tourist, I would guess that your primary focus would be on Disney or Universal. Perhaps SeaWorld, Busch Gardens, or even Legoland might be on your list. Yet, if you haven't heard of Florida's most, well, Florida of theme parks, then I wouldn't blame you. Sitting a short drive away from Disney on Orange Blossom Trail, Gatorland is definitely one of those places that gives off Florida tourist trap vibes. Yet, despite primarily being a zoological park that may appear as a cheap roadside attraction, it actually offers a really interesting experience that I would argue is worth going out of your way for. While other Orlando theme parks often suffer from overwhelming crowds, Gatorland handles its capacity well, providing an experience that is simultaneously engaging, yet relaxing, and most importantly, pretty affordable. Today I would like to cover a bit of the history for this lesser known Florida theme park, as well as providing a quick rundown of the different experiences that it currently offers. Of course, lesser known zoological exhibits also tend to bring up ethical concerns about the treatment of animals when done for profit, so that's something I'll be covering as well. With that being said, let's explore Florida's wildest theme park and gator capital of the world, Gatorland. The title of Florida's oldest amusement would go to Cypress Gardens, which opened in 1936. But Gatorland is still one of the oldest attractions that Florida offers. Its origin begins with a man named Owen Godwin Sr., who grew up on a homestead along the Kissimmee River. As both a butcher and postmaster, Godwin attempted to bring in more money to his household by taking out an alligator pit in his backyard in the 1930s. Florida has a pretty significant history of trying to attract tourists to roadside attractions as they would drive down through the state to reach the beaches. Godwin and his wife Pearl were no different, selling alligator products like keychains and belts from out of their house, and from there introducing visitors to an alligator and her babies sitting in their backyard pit. The ethics of this aside, the success of his attraction leads Godwin to purchase 16 acres of land off of the highway in Kissimmee in 1947 hoping to present Florida wildlife in a naturalistic habitat and take advantage of a boom in state tourism post-World War II. Opening in 1949, Godwin and his family opened the Florida Wildlife Institute, which primarily features alligators and snakes. Feeling that the name wasn't exciting enough to draw in tourists, Godwin renamed the enterprise to both the Snake Village and the Alligator Farm in the 1950s, before finally settling on Gatorland in 1954. Still not seeing much success, Godwin would eventually purchase a 15-foot-long crocodile known as Bone Crusher, which he would put on display. In an effort to attract more visitors and attention, Godwin offered a $1,000 prize to anyone who owned a crocodile larger than his. While the acquisition of Bone Crusher did help with park attendance, the addition of other animals such as zebras in 1962 helped to eventually grow the attraction to a decent profit. However, early Gatorland doesn't give me the impression of being particularly ethical in its exploitation of animals or providing adequate enclosures and care standards. However, after Godwin Sr. passed in 1975, his family took over and evolved the park into a more naturalistic preserve, working with the University of Florida and the Florida Wildlife Commission starting in 1979 to assist with research on restoring alligator populations. If you know anything about Florida and alligators, then I'm sure you're also aware of how they became an endangered species in the 20th century and were almost hunted to extinction. Yet the species has recovered quite well and was taken off of the endangered species list in 1987. It's obvious that the Godwin family played a large part in that recovery, so I think that they should be commended despite the earlier history of the park. In 1988, Gatorland would join with a neighboring property to become a 37-acre attraction and preserve, also evolving throughout the late 80s and 90s to become more educational. While it still included flashy attractions for tourists like the Gator Jumperoo, 
a show introduced in 1983 that had alligators lunging out of the water for raw chicken, it would continue to expand on animal conservation and education for its guests right up until today. When first arriving at this attraction, you'll be greeted with the iconic alligator jaws that have been attracting visitors from the highway since 1962. With that being said, these are not the original, as the building that once featured the structure burned down in 2006. In 2008, the new gift shop and exit complex would open, recreating the iconic landmark and working to draw people in from the road. When entering Gatorland, visitors first wander into a boardwalk area which was part of the original complex. Here they'll find live entertainment, food and drink, and of course, alligators. Personally, I find zoological exhibits to be underrated, and while I observed many people just briefly watching the gators and moving on, it's worth your time to really stay and watch. This area also includes the earlier mentioned gator jumperoo in one of the larger pits, which can be entertaining for tourists in this show with mostly dated humor. Just a quick note, but if you enjoy the video, I'd like to ask a favor of just hitting the like button. I also encourage you to quickly subscribe while hitting the bell icon if you enjoy getting notifications for theme park videos like these. One aspect I really enjoy about Gatorland is the aesthetic, drawing very obviously from historic Florida architecture and state parks. Perhaps it's not as grand as what most theme parks are capable of delivering, but I appreciate the more intimate feel of a small park like this. Throughout Gatorland, visitors will find a number of exhibits that go beyond just the gators and feature a number of other animals as well. For example, the original pits where the crocodile Bone Crusher lived is now inhabited by his son, Bone Crusher II. Speaking of crocodiles, there's also an exhibit towards the back of the park that features various species of crocodiles as well. Other exhibits will include various birds, such as kookaburras, flamingos, and even an area where various species of parrots can be found in close proximity to the visitors. With all of this being said though, I last visited Gatorland in 2019 and noticed that some of the exhibits had been changed or are under refurbishment. For example, this area which now just has a few cows was once home to white-tailed deer, and the Florida Panther exhibit is currently under refurbishment. While I wouldn't consider the theming of Gatorland to be too prevalent, there are some enclosures that do manage to incorporate it in interesting ways, such as displaying alligators in a faux swamp town setting. Really though, the best theming that the park can offer is the natural swamps of Florida. For example, there's a boardwalk appropriately named the Swamp Walk, which acts as a preserve for Florida wildlife. With patience, you can spot local birds, fish, insects, and perhaps even raccoons. If you want a closer look at the gators in a more natural setting though, the park also offers a boardwalk through the center called the Breeding Marsh. What's interesting about this area is how it has become one of the largest rookeries in Florida because of the prevalence of gators. According to the Gatorland website, alligators are beneficial to Florida water birds and that they protect nests by keeping possums and raccoons away. Obviously by providing a spacious but still dense area for the gators, it has become beneficial in protecting Florida birds as well, which you can find in abundance throughout the park. Other than animal exhibits though, Gatorland offers a number of other attractions as well, ranging from various shows, to an off-road adventure that takes riders through the swamps that feed the Florida Everglades, and even a small petting zoo. Another notable experience is the variety of zip lines found throughout the park which have visitors ziplining high in the air over the crocodile exhibits and the gator breeding marsh. Finally, the park features the Gatorland Train, which has existed as an attraction that took riders through the park since 1965. Originally premiering as a working steam engine, it was retired in 2000 and is now electric, but still works as a form of transportation that provides scenic views. While Gatorland isn't your typical themed experience, it's distinct enough to have evolved beyond just a roadside attraction and into a small theme park that offers a variety of different experiences. Yet, with places like this, it's easy to be wary due to the ethics of using animals for entertainment. 
So, how does Gatorland fare in this regard? Awareness on the effects of exploiting animal sanctuaries for profit has become increasingly prevalent. The infamous 2020 Netflix documentary titled Tiger King sheds light into the horrible conditions exotic animals are often kept in. It has become increasingly apparent that collecting exotic animals isn't particularly difficult to do in the United States and can be often passed off as educational when it is in fact done with the intent to exploit them for profit. With that being said, one has to wonder if a place like Gatorland fits into this category. For example, I read criticism concerning the condition of the exhibits in the middle boardwalk, where many of the gators were often climbing over each other for a spot in the sun. Yet, while the health and safety of animals is important, it's also advisable to be wary of people and organizations who are criticizing animal institutions when they themselves are often hyperbolic and looking for issues where none exist. I will readily admit that I know nothing about alligator care, but sticking a large volume of gators into an exhibit is often a pretty common practice and isn't an issue to my knowledge. Furthermore, many of the various animals found throughout the exhibits looked healthy and well-fed, and the exhibit maintenance was far better than most zoos I've been to. Another concern though would be the inclusion of animals in shows for entertainment, which I've found to be somewhat dicey. For example, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with having the alligators jump for meat and the jumperoo, but I did later walk by a theater where visitors could take photos while kneeling over a gator for a $10 fee. Accompanied by a handler, visitors were instructed to place their hands over the gator's snout, where tape had been wrapped to keep it from snapping at them. However, to my knowledge, while gators can have quite the powerful bite, it takes very little pressure to keep their jaws closed. While I do find taking photos with the gator to be a bit exploitative and distasteful, I did sit around and observe how it was handled. To my knowledge, the animal appeared to not be in any distress, and the handlers were careful to instruct people in such a way as to not cause it any harm. There was also a point where the gator attempted to move, and they let it finish moving to where it wanted, then dragging it gently and readjusting its legs into a natural position. This being said, I did later become aware that the theater hosts a show, which I missed, called Alligators Legends of the Swamp. Traditionally, alligator wrestling has been a part of Gatorland and other attractions that feature alligators in live shows, and while it appears that Gatorland no longer frames it this way, that's essentially what the show is. While the show does aim to be educational, it does require dragging an alligator out of the water for the demonstration, and then sitting on it until it gets tired enough to stop resisting. The gators don't appear to be physically harmed, though a study as recent of 2020 did find that these kind of performances are of course stressful to the animals. I have to say that while the animals did seem to be well taken care of throughout the park, this one particular show does rub me the wrong way, even if the animals themselves are not physically harmed. Gatorland's attitude can be a bit old fashioned at times, despite the plethora of educational content though. For example, you can often encounter what I've seen described as boomer humor. There are plenty of jokes about unhappy marriages resulting in spouses being fed to alligators. Another instance was in The Jumperoo, where one of the actors was telling the story of a legendary and vicious alligator, which was revealed to be a man's wife as the punchline. I'm not particularly a fan of these jokes that only seem to appeal to the sexist tendencies of older generations, and in addition to the axing of the gator wrestling, I think that Gatorland really needs to modernize some of its aspects. Generally, I've spoken pretty positively on what I experienced at the park though, so from here the question arises. Are these negative aspects enough to deter me from recommending the park? Despite some of the more questionable aspects of the park, I do think that Gatorland is overall a positive experience. The humor may be distasteful, and one show in particular needs to be evolved beyond just physically pinning the alligators down, but the park does shine in a number of other ways. There are plenty of animal exhibits where the animals appear to be well taken care of, and the park does play a huge role in not just the conservation of alligators, 
but Florida birds as well. The park is often educational in nature, while also hosting classrooms for field trips and other institutions, such as law enforcement and firefighters, for how to act safely when encountering Florida wildlife. While I didn't choose to pay for the zipline or the off-road experience, I do think that these are different enough from what most of the other Orlando theme parks offer in attracting visitors, and are something that I'm interested in doing the next time I go back. Perhaps Gatorland is the most alluring of Florida theme parks, but I would argue that it's worth going a bit out of your way for. Something that we've lost from Disney parks over the decades is the element of learning while also having fun, and Gatorland manages to maintain itself as both a place to be entertained with its theming and exhibits, while also focusing on the importance of education. Perhaps you don't necessarily think of Gatorland as a theme park in the traditional sense, but it's an interesting diversion from the often hyper-corporate nature of Disney and Universal, which is something that I enjoy about it despite how much I also like those parks. With all of this summarized though, I am curious as to what my audience thinks about the more negative aspects of the park. While I do enjoy the park overall, I still think we should be highlighting concerns about stressing out the gators in favor of profit and entertainment. As always though, it helps the channel out to just leave a like on the video. You can of course also subscribe with bell notification so as to be alerted to new videos when they're released.